Welcome everyone to this webinar on OpenPAV MATLAB by Adar Ben Gider, Uyghurka, and myself, Alex Dibberson. And uh, uh, we are very happy to see here uh, many people who are interested in PAV and in what we are doing as an open source community. Uh, this is an open source community which uh, has many branches that you can see here, C++ and Python and MATLAB and so on. Today we will speak only about MATLAB part, not all things we have in MATLAB, just a small part. So we'll show you uh, the agenda. Uh, Adar, please. And yeah, so we'll give you a brief history of OpenPIV, how it was born and how it's structured today. Uh, we will be very happy if any one of you uh, will join us to this open PAV community. So find your place in the software you might like. Uh, we will uh, talk today about PIV analysis, particle image velocimetry analysis using the open PAV MATLAB toolbox. Then we will speak about post processing from the flow fields to the inside using our special toolbox. And uh, the last part is wake analysis, fluid flow wake behind the body analysis using a, a new part in OpenPAV community, which is called Get Wake Toolbox. Uh, we will have the QA session at the end. And of course, we would be happy to listen uh, uh, for what kind of topics you would like to get for the next webinar. So who we are? Uh, Three of us, uh, at least on my video, we are in this order. Hadar Ben Gida is a PhD from the Technion. In the past, was a master student of myself in uh, Roy Gurka. Roy Gurka here is professor at uh, Coastal Carolina University. And myself, uh, uh, Alex Liberson, I'm professor at Tel Aviv University. Uh, we worked together many years. As you can see, uh, we started with this open source kind of direction uh, in, at the end of 90s, uh, um, almost 100 years ago. No, I'm kidding, but many years ago. So uh, uh, the first one was this Europif. It was small MATLAB code written by Uri Shavit, Uri Gurka, and myself in 1999 using MATLAB, and we immediately released it. Actually, it was created because we had to replace some buggy commercial software with the open source software and we gave it to people because we found ourselves in such a problem and we hoped others also need this solution. Uh, with the time uh, we moved on and developed uh, other codes and uh, somewhere, somewhere around 2004-2005 uh, Zach Taylor, Zachary Taylor and Roy Gurka at uh, uh, Western University in Canada uh, developed uh, a special tool, a long-term high-speed PIV. It's a unique uh, tool in the PIV world. And then they had to write a C++ version, which was very fast. And also at that time, we changed to OpenPIV, a brand name for the community as we started uh, gathering uh, tools from all kinds of places. Later on, it was a move and it's still ongoing move to move from MATLAB to Python because of a commercial licensing uh, policy of MathWorks, uh, so give a uh, code as a more free way and maybe future to have it on the cloud as a PAV as a service. Uh, but this is not uh, what we are talking today. Uh, and today we will also show this new, the newest toolbox uh, that will be very soon published in uh, one of the uh, open source journals, uh, the toolbox to estimate aerodynamic forces uh, from wakes. And uh, Adar Ben Gida is here with us and uh, we'll explain about it. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll uh, start with the webinar and the webinar uh, will explain you what will be the demonstration experiment we will show today. Roy, unmute yourself. Thanks, Alex. Um, so the data that we will show today uh, in order to demonstrate the capabilities and features of the OpenPIV and its toolboxes um, is um, obtained for um, high speed, from high-speed PIV, PIV data. The test case that we're gonna talk about is we made, we are doing, and we made over the last 10 years, 
they're running experiments in a climatic wind tunnel where we fly birds. Uh, they fly them free. They, they fly freely, uh, no constraints, and we measure the wake behind the body and the wings of various birds. Today, we're going to show data that was collected uh, behind the European starling, which is a small migratory bird. Um, the measurements were taken, as I said, in the climatic wind tunnel. It's a closed wind tunnel where we control temperature, pressure, and wind. The speed um, of the wind was about 10 meter per second, so we're looking at Reynolds number of about 60,000. Um, what you're seeing here in this slide is a combination of PIV data and high-speed imaging. So the top left uh, subplot, figure, subplot pictures showing uh, the motion of the wings um, acquired by high-speed camera. And then the bottom left shows an instantaneous PIV image um, that we collect with our um, specially designed uh, time resolved PIV system this system was specially designed such that we can sample um, about 20 minutes of data uh, with one kilohertz sampling rate per second. So we end up with having hundred thousands of images. The end result is what is shown here conceptually with some sort of a wake evolution as the bird move on. So what we have here is a two dimensional PIV data um, time resolved. And this is going to be our focus when we're going to now demonstrate the toolbox capabilities. Um, the bottom right uh, figure shows conceptually how we are calculating um, the forces, meaning drag and lift, based on the wake. These calculations are based on earlier work by, er, earlier work by von Karman and Theodorson, and Hadar will explain it later. I'll expect to you. Yeah, so we want to be sure, we will show you all the way from the images to the PAV flow field, from the PAV flow field to the vorticity maps, from the vorticity maps to this wake reconstruction and the result of the forces, okay? That will be our uh, path. Before we start with uh, toolboxes, I want to give a very, very brief introduction to what is particle image velocimetry, at least in terms that OpenPIV in MATLAB is implemented. So we will be all on the same page in terms of introduction to PIV. I apologize for those who know what PIV is, but we want to be also our other participants with us uh, as we move on. So very, very briefly, what is the particle image velocimetry? We need particles. These are bright dots. We need images of those particles, as you see, several of those images because we need motion, and velocimetry is because we measure velocity, okay? So in this uh, moving uh, GIF image, you see all the move movement and then the arrows that uh, are showing the displacement and velocity of these particles. So we will show you how it's done very slowly. First, we need two images to get the motion. And typically in PIV, we have two lasers, these vertical lines are showing laser pulses. Every laser pulse creates one image. Between two laser pulses, we have a very short time interval that we will call delta T. Between every pair, we will have a longer time, which we call T, time between image pairs. This will be the time between velocity fields. If you have a time-resolved case, also T becomes very short. But now we are focused on the small delta T between two laser pulses. If I know two images, F that respects the first pulse and G, which is the second pulse, and we have this motion between them, you can recognize the motion of the particles in different regions of the image, different kind of motion. And then we can take these two images, break them, split them into small windows. We will call them interrogation windows. In every such a window, there is a motion. If we take one a, a small interrogation window as an example and zoom in, and we will show movement within this small window. This small window is about 30 pixels in a, each direction. So you see several particles. They move into different direction. Every particle has its own motion, but we are talking about fluid flow. 
and this is a small window, and we want to find a displacement with this small window as a single vector. So we are looking for most probable displacement of this image. How do we do most probable displacement? We do what is called an image processing pattern matching, or specifically in our case, it's a cross correlation analysis. We cross correlate these two images and we look for the highest peak, which is the most probable position of the motion of the image two in respect to image one. And then we put this vector, which will be this displacement in pixels or, or pixel units uh, of the image, but we can also decode back on, and reveal the velocity field if we know how this image is formed. What is the magnification ratio? What is the delta T between pulses? Okay, so this is PIV 101. Uh, again, if you have further questions, please write in the chat. We will try to address it as we go. Now we will show you what I've just explained very briefly in OpenPIV MATLAB toolbox. Every piece of code that we are doing, you can find. It's written in the GitHub. You can find every line. But we will show you the graphic user interface, how you can actually, by a few clicks, implement these five steps of loading pair of images, selecting region of interest in this image, select the interrogation window size, this 32 or whatever pixel size, filters that if you want to remove some noise, and how the output looks like in output in OpenPV MATLAB. So after this brief introduction, you can follow the full tutorial. We will not show you all the capabilities in this uh, short webinar, uh, but there are many more. You are welcome to join us on the OpenPV users group and ask questions, so ask questions here. Uh, let's show it in live demo, Adar. So Adar will be our uh, MATLAB machine. Uh, creating uh, everything in live. So what you are seeing is happening in live. We have the GUI, the graphical user interface. Uh, we have to move every time MATLAB uh, has a new version of MATLAB. We, has to update, we have to update the GUI. The code underneath remains pretty much the same since the beginning. So we need to upload with file load a pair of images. And these are real birds images that uh, Roy have, uh, right? So we take one pair, we don't need many, I think. Yeah. So when you have this uh, pair of images, it's a wake of a bird. You don't see the bird, bird is on, the, on your left. But uh, in the bottom you have these two arrows that you can switch and have the same sense of motion as we have shown in the, yeah, so you have some sense of motion. The flow is moving from left to right, right? So now we can do selection of those parameters. And I will go briefly about these parameters. The first line is the interrogation window size. It doesn't have to be square. It can be smaller in one dimension, rectangular, if, if the flow is only in one, in, mostly in one direction. But because we use Fourier transform cross-correlation, this will be values which are power of two. So 32 and 64 uh, and so on. You can also have not a full uh, jump between every small interrogation windows. You can shift it kind of continuously and have overlaps. This is this overlap horizontal or vertical spacing. This will help you to increase partial resolution. The next one, it's a signal to noise type of calculation and signal to noise value will be a threshold for you between signal to noise and, uh, and uh, what is rejected as, uh, in terms of signal to noise. What is signal to noise? One value can be the highest peak to the second highest peak, saying there are two probable directions and we are not sure, sure which one is the right. If these two peaks are almost equal, we better reject both uh, because we are not sure. It's a low uncertainty. If we, we can measure also the peak relative to the average, of this cross correlation, again, if a peak is very shallow, although we found it, but it's not a certain peak, we should also reject it probably. All these values are user defined parameters. You have to go in, try something on a pair of images or some images, see the values of signal to noise, and then try to find those which are wrong from your point of view. And there are five, 10% of wrong vectors, not if you have more wrong vectors, something is wrong about the images. Next two parameters are related to the physical uh, units. If you want to convert pixels to millimeters or meters, depends on your magnification. And if you know delta T between your laser pulses, you put it here. If you don't, you can leave it as is. You will get values in pixels 
per uh, delta t. So you can, and we kind of recommend it, if you don't know the values correctly, you can leave them as pixels and later convert them. The next one is a sort of outlayer filter. If you, sometimes you will find some small interrogation windows that gives you completely a wrong vector looking into the direction which is impossible. And in this case, and in this case you might want to reject them. This outlayer number is a number of standard deviations you consider as outlayer. So usually it's free if you talk about statistics of Gaussian, but you can leave 100 and almost nothing will be thrown away. You will keep all the raw data as is and non-filter it. Then we will just go to select ROI. ROI is the region of interest. Sometimes you don't want all the image to be analyzed, but only some portion of it. So Hadar will show you now how we choose this rectangle. Yeah, and you will see some uh, window and then we can start and process and get these arrows. Uh, you can also do pre-processing, like uh, have the uh, image inverted, image uh, uh, filter it before analysis, but we don't have time for this. And we will uh, uh, share with you the presentation and there is a link to the OpenPIV MATLAB tutorial on YouTube, which you can uh, easily find by Googling and uh, getting the results. How the results looks like. In the same folder where images are, you will have also per every pair of images that you analyze, three text files, three ASCII files. One will be underscore no field, which is a raw data. It's just five columns of X, Y, pixel positions, U, V, pixel displacement or converted displacement, as written in the header. And the last column is this signal to noise. It's a peak to peak ratio. So, uh, that also gives you the size of rows and columns, but uh, that's for later use. There will be no filter, there will be filter, and there will be final file that has an extension .vec, which was the header, and this .vec files is that what we will use in the next step as a post-processing. So we'll have a long list of vec files that we created for this bird uh, wake analysis. We'll load them into another MATLAB tool, and Rui will be explaining what we get there. So, Rui, please. Okay, thanks. So, um, once um, the data is now uh, saved and we have moved from an image-based uh, data to a physical-based data, which is the velocity maps, um, the next step is what do we do with them? So we are done pretty much with the PIV so-called analysis, and we want to move to the PIV post-analysis. Um, the motivation to write this software came, started about 15 years ago, where we had some requests from people asking us to share thoughts and help with, with what, what do we do next? Meaning we need to take the data and start manipulating it, because at the end of the day, we don't just want velocity maps, we want to calculate different flow properties in the field. Um, and that resulted with writing some sort of a very broad platform um, to run simple flow um, characterizations uh, or properties um, that will help characterize the flow per given case. So the spatial and temporal toolbox, I, I will comment first, is that it does not provide a full answer um, for any given question in, in, in fluids. It tries to answer and uh, allow some basic characterization, for example, how does the vorticity look like, strain field, the strain field looks like, maybe turbulence intensity, maybe Raymond stress, but it doesn't go through a more detailed analysis. There were, again, and as Alex mentioned, all the line codes are, are open and you can access and copy and do whatever you want with them. And the way that this partial and temporal toolbox is built is we, we, we designed the toolbox um, that is conceptually divided into two sections. One is qualitative and one is quantitative. So at the qualitative section, we can observe and visualize um, the flow field. And on the quantitative measure side, we can take what we observe and plot some figures and, and try to, to quantify 
um, in a physical space, um, what did we measure? So let's start the toolbox and, 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 and run, run quickly through um, certain commands. So the toolbox is, 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 is similar in its concept to the open PAV. And the reason is that we're trying to keep everything consistent. So the first thing that we do is, is the input is the data that has been um, exported by the open PAV. So let's go to file and load vector files. We also have the option to load map files. And let's load, let's say five vector, fi five vector maps or 10 vector maps. Um, just, to, just to consume time. So we mark the vector maps that we want to, to load. We click on add, we add them, we click done. And then on what we see here is the main frame of the GUI shows you a velocity vector map representation. If possible, Hadar, go to the error size and click free. So, um, each time we click uh, a number or a function in the GUI, it will automatically update the, the window. So what we see here is like this. On the, right, on the left side, we have the visualization or what we are um, doing. And on the right side, we have the functions. The functions are comprised, as I said, from a qualitative side and a quantitative side. The qualitative side appears in select and will go there immediately, and the quantitative side appears at spatial. So at the spatial, the first thing that comes up is we have the ability to either click on ensemble or fluctuations. An ensemble is calculating the mean based on the data loaded. If you quickly look at the bottom right of the GUI, uh, it's written flow field. And here it's written 59 out of 475. That means that 175 vector maps have been uploaded. And right now we are looking at map number 59. We can uh, move next, we can move uh, forward and backward. We can animate uh, whatever we're plotting and we can also create a movie by clicking a button and then a, a movie will be generated with an AVI format of everything that has been um, calculated um, on the left side of the GUI. So we can calculate ensemble, which corresponds to, in this case, averaging 175 maps. Or we can click on fluctuations. Let's click on fluctuations. And then um, what's going to happen is that the GUI will take the instantaneous images and perform Reynolds, a standard classical decomposition, uh, meaning subtracting the average and represent the U and V as fluctuating components. Um, we can go now to contour quantity. And in the contour quantity, we have a drop down menu that enables us to um, calculate and show different uh, properties for the fluctuation field. And if I unclick the fluctuations, let's unclick the fluctuations, um, the same drop down menu will appear, but now it will correspond to the instantaneous values. So, for example, if I click now on vorticity, um, the toolbox will calculate now the vorticity over the entire domain. I will go to the contour property and I can represent the contours as flood, color line, or flood plus line. Let's present it as flood. And I can label the flood, the, the colors. I can add the color bar. And I also have an option. Um, there is another drop down menu under each field. And here, what it means is that the color bar can vary the color range based on, let's go back again to the drop down menu, please, Hadar. Right, so each field means that it's going to calculate the vorticity and mark them in colors um, in reference to the instantaneous field that we just uh, uh, calculated. All fields, it's going to calculate and represent colors based on the average vorticity in this case. And all to display will calculate, the, will present the colors based on the last instantaneous image that was uploaded um, in the viewing section. 
So, and I can also go to manual and select the color bar or col control level range. And in that sense, I can visually emphasize flow patterns or features that I'm looking at in order to, to find the right, the, the, the right proportion in order to demonstrate how the flow behaves or if there is, for example, in that case, we have a, a wing that is flapping. So I'm mainly looking at shedding and this shedding will be formed in alternating vortices. And that's what I would expect to see alternating vortices red and blue moving downstream uh, and shedded. So this is the qual uh, qualitative part. I can now move to the quantitative part. So let's assume we, let's, before we move to the quantitative part, the concept, the, co the, the, the thinking behind the quantitative part is that now I'm going to select a property that I would like to plot. So let's go to ensemble, for example. And in ensemble, let's click um, on, Sorry, let's go to ensemble and click also on fluctuations. When we click on both, there is a new drop down menu running down. And these are what we call turbulence, classical turbulence properties. Um, for example, Raynaud stress, um, RMS, your RMS is, means turbulence, uh, turb kinetic turbulence, uh, uh, turbulent intensity. Um, we have TKE, it's turbulence kinetic energy. We have a uh, production. We have some sort of dissipation estimates based on 2D. We have entropy, which corresponds to the RMS of rotacity. So let's click on entropy, for example. And let's go to select. And in select, we can either select points, region, columns, or rows. Um, let's select regions. So by selecting regions, we are just, we simply click on the region on the columns that we want to uh, plot. Um, in that case, we selected three plots with the, uh, and then we go to profile. Uh, if we click on profile, a new window will open. And this window will generate a profile of the quantity that was defined before. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of this um, window, we can plot uh, the profile either in columns or in rows. Um, we can also take, we had three columns and we can average the three columns and generate a new um, curve that is an average of everything. Most importantly is that I can take this uh, figure and let's go to export. And here I can either export it to figure, which is a fig uh, format in MATLAB, or to a CSV file, which is a ASCII uh, file that can be loaded later on. So this is the quantitative part. Sorry, the qualitative part, the quantitative part, I apologize. And we can perform the same, the same procedure on every given quantity within the toolbox. We can perform the same procedure on multiple regions and areas and so forth. The last thing that I want to talk about is the so-called time analysis. So if you look at the select below, below profile, um, if I click time analysis, a new window will open. And this window enables us to perform some basic um, calculations related to, to um, the temporal description of the, of the flow. So the first thing, the upper figure um, shows us the evolution of the velocity over 175 maps. Now, this is based on the selection we made uh, before. So we have three columns, therefore the GUI will take the three columns, calculate the velocity over the three columns and present it. Um, we can do it for U, we can do it for V, for U prime and for V prime. These all can be, uh, can be done. Um, as you can see, we can plot average or time series. And if we click on time series, it will give us three curves because we have three columns, uh, multiple curves because we have three columns times the points in the column. 
So let's go back to average. Now the, the, the drop down menu below it, which is called analysis, if we click on quantity, we can calculate here several quantities. These quantities corresponds to um, auto and spatial correlation function in the flow and spectral, uh, spectral uh, energy distribution. So RRI uh, of T gives us the auto correlation in time of the selected uh, property in the selected region. In that case, it's going to calculate the auto correlation of U over the columns over time. Um, R1 corresponds to um, the streamwise direction, R2 corresponds to the normal direction, and E F corresponds to the um, spectral distribution, spectral description in time, and EK1, EK2 follow the Kolmogorov uh, classical spectral, uh, uh, spectral uh, description, where we calculate um, energy of either the U or the V um, in space, either in the streamwise or the normal direction. Everything can be exported. Now let's go back, let's close it for a second and go back to the main time toolbox. And in the main time toolbox, if I go back to file, I see that I can export, I, can, I have load, 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 which is loading the data and export to figure or export to math file. Export to figure here will export um, this, whatever we have on the left, on the left um, section of the window. Most important function here is the export to mat file. And when we click export to mat file, the GUI will take all the data that has been analyzed so far, all the calculations that has been made so far, and save everything in a mat format. So if we calculated Right now, entropy, entropy will be saved. If we calculate the entropy and prior to this, we calculate vorticity, both will be saved. One thing that I forgot to mention is what the GUI is doing in sorting the data. We sort the data like a cartridge. So we put the components U and V in the first and second dimension. And then the velocity maps, sequences, are stored in the third dimension. So you can think of a cartridge where we have, we access each time a different slot. Each slot represent a different velocity map. And within each slot, we have access in a two dimensions to the U and V corresponding to their coordinate uh, location. And I think here I can pass it to Hadar. Okay, hello everyone. Um, let's just share my screen with you guys, uh, just a second. Okay. So what we do with the, uh, mat file Roy just described. So after we load the, uh, VEC files, uh, extracted from open PAV MATLAB into the spatial toolbox, um, remember, of course, those are the wake images, wake uh, PAV images taken behind the flying bird in the wind tunnel. So when we load those into the uh, spatial toolbox and extract them as a mat file, now we have all we need in terms of flow properties, meaning vorticity or whatever uh, quantity we needed to further analyze the wake uh, in a more advanced way. So the get wake is, um, is a toolbox for generating um, and uh, uh, reconstructing the wake behind any uh, uh, bluff body that generates a, a wake. Uh, in this case, uh, it's a bird uh, flying in a wind tunnel. So what it does, it allows us to reconstruct the wake from uh, time as well as PIV data and also estimate the forces in terms of the drag and the uh, circulatory lift. Uh, from, of course, the wake data. So it's a collection basically of MATLAB subroutines and a GUI for cross-processing time as well as wake data, as I just mentioned. Uh, it accepts the uh, PAV wake data uh, extracted from the uh, spatial toolbox uh, as a MAT file. And as I mentioned, it can reconstruct the wake signature. And now it does 
it does it, I will just describe. So um, remember, this is the experimental setup. Uh, here we have the uh, uh, wind tunnel test section uh, in which the bird was flying. You can see the bird here in the middle of the wind tunnel. And so the laser was generating or illuminating the uh, light sheet uh, from the bottom and two cameras were used. Uh, those two were high speed cameras, one for uh, uh, taking images or kinematic images of the bird and another one uh, taking PAV images uh, behind the bird in the wake. So uh, when the bird was flying, we have simultaneously uh, captured the images uh, of both the bird and its wake. Um, so here you can see the setup. Of course, we, uh, the bird was safe because we used infrared uh, trigger device to uh, uh, not arm the bird in terms of the laser light sheet. Um, so, this is how it looks in terms of the data taken, meaning now I will show you an animation of both the PAV and kinematic camera uh, simultaneously uh, capturing the bird kinematics and the wake data. Uh, so you can see them both as they uh, uh, were taken live. So you can see here the bird, the bird was moving in the wind tunnel, flapping its wings, and the wake was generated uh, behind. Uh, taken by the time resolved PAV uh, system. So when we look on the uh, uh, velocity in the new wake, so we can see that we have, uh, let's say, six images. And if we look, look on those uh, six images, you can see that the same flow quantity, if I just mark it with, uh, with an X bar, you can see it uh, um, changing or um, shifting in the wake. Uh, and still remaining at the same PAV window where we are capturing in the wake. So this means that uh, our data was taken in a really time result fashion, meaning that we can, if we can take those images and overlap them, we can create a, a reconstruction of the wake signature and not just seeing it as an animation. Uh, and from the signature, we can uh, post-process in the data much more, uh, uh, much, much better than the animation. Uh, in terms of vorticity in the near wake, now you can see the same plots just in terms of vorticity and you can see the same structure, the same structure, sorry, are um, showing at the same images, but still remains at the same window for the uh, two millisecond window between two uh, PAV velocity maps taken. So how this is done? So we first see that um, uh, we need to change your presentation of the data a little bit. Uh, presently, when we look at the wake data, we see, a, we see it as a sequence of images in time. This, of course, makes it difficult to get the global picture of the wake. Uh, yet, if we look on some images taken at different times, let's say this image and another wake image, see that it's, uh, it is related to different uh, bird uh, uh, geometrical uh, uh, wing, wing uh, um, uh, shapes. So now you see the same bird as it flaps its wings, but the wake data is different. Uh, and so we need uh, to uh, look on the same images taken at different times and now we can obtain a composite picture of the wake pattern as shown below. So you see that if we look at different times, we can actually reconstruct the wake. Uh, basically what we did is invoking Taylor's frozen, frozen flow hypothesis to represent the time series as the wake composite. Uh, with this method, we can take the image at a certain time and plot the subsequent image on top of it with a spatial shift. And we can do this for the entire time series of measurements to reconstruct the full wake signature behind any bluff body, where in our case, it's a bird. So how it, how it is being done? So uh, we make it a smart way in terms of uh, um, mathematical algorithm uh, by using a cross correlation algorithm. So we take two images and calculate two velocity images, sorry, and calculate the spatial shift between those uh, uh, velocity maps in terms of the matching, the cross correlation uh, matching between those. And here you can see two images, one velocity maps. One is the uh, black one, another one is the red one. And you can see that these two velocity maps are matched 
uh, uh, when we uh, uh, invoke the cross correlation at the uh, at the 0 0.1 uh, uh, streamless distance, uh, both for the u velocity component and the v velocity component. So if we overlap these two together, uh, we can start generating or reconstructing uh, uh, the wake signature behind the beard. So this is basically the uh, uh, um, the methodology uh, we use for reconstructing the wake. Um, and this is the GUI itself. So the get wake GUI is basically your way to just do, it, do whatever I just said in terms of reconstructing the wake signature and then use it to estimate the forces. So now let's just shift for the uh, MATLAB uh, demonstration. Um, so just a couple of seconds. And okay, so when you start, you uh, uh, when you start to wake the get wake uh, GUI, you will see this window. So the first thing you need to do, remember, is to upload uh, by loading load the uh, inputs of uh, the the bluff body, the PAV system, and the flow. Uh, uh, and the flow uh, uh, field that you just want to describe the wake for. So you can see the inputs, you can see the PIV system inputs, you have the laser delta T, uh, the uh, pixel to centimeters ratio, delta T uh, of the uh, velocity maps, and of course the bluff body characteristics. Um, the body can do uh, a flocking wing motion or it just can be a stationary body. In our example, of course, the, the bird has a flopping wing. So we choose the motion type, which is a flopping wing. And you can also edit the flow uh, 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 characteristics here. So if I just use the inputs and load them, I, I can just load the inputs of the bird, which I uh, extracted earlier uh, for this demonstration. So when I load it, you can see the uh, values have changed to the values that are matched for the uh, experiment we just done. Um, and after we load the inputs, now we can load the PAV data. And remember, this is the math file Roy just mentioned uh, uh, that was extracted from the spatial toolbox. So if I press this button, now I need to load uh, the wake data saved, remember, as a math file. So when I load it, now you can see uh, uh, the path of the uh, math file. And so now we are ready to reconstruct the wake. And now we do it is basically we need to choose a sequence of uh, uh, velocity vector maps to generate the wake for. So in this example, let's just take, uh, I would say, um, image number 101 till image 120. And here I chose the cross correlation parameter as the velocity fluctuations, uh, which is the parameter according, uh, the flow parameter according to which the cross correlation uh, was used to overlap the uh, instantaneous velocity images one on top another and generate the wake. So when you press the generate wake button, and uh, now the GUI, the GUI will start working and now you can see the result. This is the wake that was generated behind. And if I just use un, un uh, press the display vectors, now you can see it in terms of uh, um, just the vorticity. You can change or use any color map you want. You can use the first one. You can use the second one. It has four color maps to be used. You can change. Uh, you can use a threshold. Here I use the threshold for the vorticity to just clean uh, uh, the wake to just see the structures much more clearly. You can change again the normalized vorticity values uh, and the range of them. And you can also change the vector size, the scale of it. If I just press it, you can see it in, not in a scale mode. And once you are done, you now can just go the wake uh, menu bar on top and save the wake as a plot, just uh, um, extract it into a, a figure to be used later on. So after we have um, uh, the wake being generated and visualized the way we want it and extract it, uh, as we want. Now we are ready to estimate the forces. So here I'm going to show you how you can do it. Is it's really just simple. Um, if I uh, if I go into this uh, forces uh, uh, zone section, I let's say the bird was doing four wing bits, and I want to show the drug uh, 
uh, for the uh, third wing bit. So I just choose the third wing bit uh, to be shown and I want to show you the drag and I, if I press the drag button, now you can see the estimation of the drag for the wing bit, for the third wing bit. And so uh, you can see the variation of the drag coefficient in terms of the streamer's distance in the wake be taken from the measurements, uh, the PAV measurements behind the beard. And you can see here three components. One is the steady, the CD0 is the steady drag coefficient. And the CD1 is the unsteady term uh, derived from the unsteady, uh, unsteady uh, motion in the flow uh, in the new wake behind the beard. So you can see here the motion and the variation, sorry, of the drag along the wake. Remember, we uh, can also use and show the data in terms of time. So if I choose the T over T, which is the normal last time, now I can show the same drag plot, but over time. So now you can see the same direct variation, but now the X axis is just the normal last time where T, the, the big T is, the large T is basically the, uh, um, um, the flopping cycle the, uh, of the bird. Uh, so you can see it for one wind bit cycle uh, of the bird and you can see that during this phase where the gray region marks the upstroke phase of the bird, you can see really large values of drag during this phase where the bird was slowly, uh, basically uh, um, taking its wings upwards, folding them back and generating much more drag than the downstroke phase uh, showing here. After we generate the drag, now we can generate the lift and if I press this button here, now you can see the lift being generated and here it is. This is the uh, circulatory lift uh, coefficient. So it means it shows you the variation in lift uh, 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 behind the bird uh, in terms of time uh, for the uh, wing bit. So you can see that during the downstroke you have an, up, an impulse of lift generating, generating by, by the bird flapping its wings downwards. But during the, down, the upstroke phase where the bird was folding its, its wings backwards and upwards, now you see that you actually have had some loose of lift uh, because the wings are not more, uh, not just, not, not so aerodynamically uh, lifting surfaces anymore. So here it is, you can do whatever you want with this GUI. You can actually uh, uh, calculate it for just the entire full wing bit. So if I uh, just set one here to start it at the first wing bit and four, you can generate the same plots, the drag and the circulatory lift for the consecutive four wing bits that the bird was performing. And now you can see the same plot, but for four consecutive images, where again, you can see the uh, gray regions and the white regions uh, margins are basically related to the different wing bits uh, faces and uh, down downstroke is the uh, white region and upstroke are upstrokes are the uh, gray region and you can see the variation in lifting circulatory lift during those wing bits so just a remark all those force estimations are based on two-dimensional flow analysis so of course you have three-dimensional force forces acting on the bird uh, but from those two-dimensional estimations, you can gain much more insight on the uh, forces exerted on the bird um, than any other method uh, uh, knowing out there. Uh, so using those estimations, you can really get some really cool insights on whatever bluff body you are investigating uh, and you, if you have a time result PIV in its, in its near way. Uh, so that's all, and now I will pass, uh, pass it on to Alex. Uh, thank you, Adar. Thank you, Rui. Uh, Adar, there's one question. Uh, so the flow is three-dimensional. Just hypothetically, if you would have a three-dimensional PIV, would be this extendable to 3D case? Well, for three-dimensional case, we need to remember that, um, so, the estimations themselves, the force estimations, are based on two-dimensional methods. So in terms of the drag, it, it basically based on the deficit, um, which is a two-dimensional uh, methodology, and the uh, unsteady variation of the, uh, of the velocities. Uh, so this will be only impl implicated for two-dimensional uh, uh, analysis. 
Uh, this again will be the same for the lift because those are uh, methods that have been used uh, ever since Theodorson was uh, uh, in Plados in the uh, late 30s. Yeah. Okay. Um, I if I can, if I can, hold, if I can share some insight. Um, Go ahead. So yes, um, it's 2D for the drug deficit because Goethe in 1938 uh, formulated for a two-dimensional slope. But if you if you look at the ba uh, uh, at the momentum equations where Goethe took it and we actually implemented it in one of our papers, um, these are the, the deficit and the unsteadiness results from um, two terms in the momentum equations once you apply the Reynolds Reynolds theorem to, to the momentum to the momentum force to the momentum sorry a uh, formulation. So you can do it for 3D based on the momentum equation. There is nothing that prevents anybody to go ahead and, 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 and formulate what Goethe did for 2D and formulate it for 3D. Um, I think the main challenge will be the, interp the interpretation of the result. Because when you talk about drug, you usually talk about some scalar value um, that means something about forces. Um, so this will be the main challenge. I think that if you have a 3D PAV, you can easily calculate the drug based on a momentum equation. It's just the interpretation will be difficult. And, and the same corresponds to, to the lift because again, um, what Hadar is doing is using um, um, unsteady viscous theory for lift. Um, but, but these are again derived from the momentum equation. So you can go back to the momentum equations and release the constraint of 2D and use the full 3D description, again, interpretation will be something to be addressed. Sorry. Okay, for for uh, participants, we would say that uh, there is a question about open access. So everything is open access, but plus we will have a very soon a paper out with uh, also on archive, right? So we'll have the draft of the paper on archive and open access that will show the equations behind uh, the gateway plus all the description uh, on top of this webinar. So it will be a written description and, uh, and that's it. Uh, you have here a slide where you can see uh, what we kind of saying, where is open PAV MATLAB in respect to the rest of the world in terms of open or closed PAV sources. What, what PAV, open PAV has is its uniqueness, and that's what we kind of uh, uh, try not to oversell now, but uh, basically we, what we are saying, is along the years, we developed several tools for our own research. And you can find scientific papers and the MATLAB or Python or C++ toolboxes attached to it, and that's it. If you just follow every toolbox, it has a link to the paper where you can find the information. So we have background oriented children and we have uh, among the first, definitely the first uh, PAV from a uh, pressure from PAV in 99 and proper orthogonal decomposition. We also were lucky to learn this method quite a long time ago and present it in uh, use with PAV. And now get wake again, you see this is a, a state-of-the-art measurements or maybe frontier measurements in terms of free flying birds. Uh, I want now to move to the questions that we had. Okay, so I have three questions that we need to go back to the interrogation window images. If we can on the, uh, Adar please on the slides where we have the PAV introduction. So the FG images and, uh, and then yeah, so FG, if you just can show the image. So one question was, how do we choose the interrogation window? Another question was size. Another question was, just a second, how do we choose the density of the tracer? So can you move one back, please? So this is a good density of tracers, okay? You don't have empty spaces and you have more or less uh, well randomly distributed particles. Now, what it means a good density, uh, we should basically send everyone to the book by Rafael et al, A Practical Introduction to PAV. 
I think that's the best book everyone can read to get all the answers there in very uh, detailed and theoretical framework. For us, we will just mention a few kind of thumb rules, okay? So this is a good image. If you zoom in, you go to the small interrogation window, please, Adar, show us interrogation window. In this interrogation window, we should say two things. The thumb rules say the motion should be about a one quarter of the interrogation window size, okay? Depends, of course, on your velocity, on a number of uh, particles and the magnification. And the second thing we say, usually thumb of rule says to have about eight to 10 pairs of particles, which means particles that are remaining within the interrogation window and not leaving out every second image, okay? Uh, Rui, do you want to say something about that? We don't hear you, Rui. I just want to reinforce two, two quick things. Um, Rafael is a great um, source. Uh, this thumb, all these thumb rules can be found um, in Adrian, 1991, Annual Review in Fluid Mechanics. Yeah. Um, I think the name of the, 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 the paper is, is Imaging something. Um, if you click Adrian, Ron, Adrian, Annual Review Fluid Mechanics 91, you will find it. Okay. All these thumb rules have been formulated in this paper. Um, it's not easy to find the proper arguments why eight to 10 particles um, are optimized or not optimized, serves as a minimal thumb rule, but it's working and it's working over 30 years and it's working. Um, I just want to comment about the, the thumb rule that um, quarter uh, that the displacement is roughly between quarter to half of your interrogation size. This is correct when you're talking about small interrogation windows. If you choose an interrogation window that is 128 pixel by 128 pixels, the chances that the correlation engine will be able to generate a 64 pixel displacement is very low. Um, so just be mindful that uh, these numbers are ballpark numbers that were valid for choosing the so-called classical windows of 16 pixel by 16, 32 by 32, and 64 by 64. From our experiment experience, I don't think we ever managed to obtain pixel displacements more than 15 to 20 pixels over any interrogation window that we chose. And the reasons are, are, are associated with the fact that we're using a digital Fourier transform um, that, is a, that is a very efficient technique, but has its own um, subtleties and efficiencies. Alex, back to you. Yeah, and the last uh, question, if you can go to the next slide, please, with the correlation uh, map. Yeah, so I want to explain here again about signal to noise ratio, okay? So what does it mean we have a high probability of displacement the high probability displacement means that most of the particles and the background, it's not only the bright parts, the, the whole flow is moving. Most of this window moved most probably into this position and that you have a high peak of correlation and all the rest will be low because there is missed or anti-correlation, no correlation, zero correlation. Now, then it means that the peak will be high and the valley will be flat and both peak and second peak or peak to mean will be high, will be large values. Now, if you have the second peak, okay, again, you have the highest peak and the second mountain next to it. And if these peaks are close to each other, although the, the valley around is flat, it means there's probably some particles moving into one direction and other particles moving to other direction. It means you choose a too large window and then there are different motions that are included in this window. And the PAV cross-correlation analysis says there are two probable positions. We consider it as low signal to noise ratio because it's very difficult to know whether this window is properly chosen and moving in that direction. Therefore, this will also report a low signal to noise ratio, close to one. So for us, signal to noise ratio equal to one means two peaks are equal or peak is so low that the average is almost of the same size. 
High signal to noise ratio means signal is much larger than the noise. Okay, so I think we answered here about signal to noise ratio and interrogation window. We also had a question about pre processing. So if you can go please quickly just to the view of the GUI, or maybe in math, no, I think GUI is enough. Yeah, the GUI window. Yeah. And yeah, this is the old GUI movie. So you need to open the MATLAB one, please. Sorry. The live, yeah. The picture here is the old GUI and uh, that didn't have the pre-processing term. So can you open MATLAB, please, with the open PIV GUI MATLAB? We'll just show this checkbox where you can do pre-processing. So some people ask in the chat whether we can do dynamic masking or some kind of image processing before we analyze. And the answer is yes. Uh, in the GUI, you have a checkbox just above the start button, which is called pre-processing routine. If you click here and select one, we have a demo, several demonstration. Uh, they all start like, uh, uh, they all start like pre-process underscore something. So you can choose one of those and see how it's done. Basically, it loads image before going to PIV analysis, does the masking, and or or some other method. Sometimes we increase histo uh, do histogramic histogram equalization to increase contrast. Uh, sometimes your images are not evenly illuminated, and you want to remove the background. So all these can be done just in the loop or in the flowchart of uh, processing PIV. Uh, and, and, and there is a template that you can just use that basically takes an image as an input and puts the image as an output. And uh, everything you put in can be dynamic masking or whatever. Uh, this recording will be available. So we will uh, post the recording on the LinkedIn and uh, on our YouTube uh, channel and uh, of course on the forum, uh, Google group. Uh, somebody asked for maybe two peaks of correlation. Yes, of course, if you have if you have, for instance, two vortices within the interrogation window, two vortices, each one will give you a different correlation peak. And that's, that's okay, because the, these are two halves of the window moving in two different directions. It means you need to decrease your interrogation window uh, and if, or increase magnification and decrease interrogation window. Uh, yeah, so Rui answer here, answered here about signal to noise filter. Uh, can we demonstrate the jump function? Yes, we can demonstrate the jump function. So, uh, Adar, can you please load, uh, I don't know, five, six pairs? Jump function was invented not for the pairs of images, but for images we record as a sequence. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. But here we can show how it works. Basically, if you press just start, you press this, you process the first and the second image. That's the pairs, then the third and the fourth and so on. But I can say if the flow is too slow, I don't want to do the first and the second. I want to do the first and the tenth, second and the eleventh and so on. So if you put jump here, it will not work, right? Because we have in pairs. Yeah. So if you will have a sequence, one, two, three, four, five numbered as a sequence, then the jump function will be available as a text no, I don't think you don't, you don't need it. It's just, yeah, you can do, yeah, that's enough, I think. So if you load only first the image, so jump is now available. And now we can process not the first and the second, but the first and the fifth. So you can change jump to two or three. Probably it will not work now because these images are not in the recorded, but press start and you will see that you get output yeah, so this is, of course, wrong correlation because we are correlating long image and wrong images. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, anything else? Um, uh, correlation result. Yes, there is even a tool. Somebody wrote a small GUI that reads the data and kind of once the PIV is running, shown on the side the correlation map. So it's also possible, but as Roy answered this correctly, everything we do is in MATLAB. You can just, you know, go in, do debug, keyword stop and whatever, and just do whatever you want. And we want you please suggest if you find the error or bug and suggest your features. And uh, we're happy to hear feedback from you. I think we should stop now as, uh, uh, okay, uh, Python. Yes, Python has a, uh, 
similar capability, not the same capability, it's not as complete as MATLAB because of, we don't have get wake there, we don't have POD there, pressure or BOS, but in terms of PAV, it has other features. It has, uh, um, it has also multi-window uh, or window deformation algorithms and people develop GUIs as we move on. Uh, but it's it's up to you to choose one of the versions and, and, and choose it. Python is basically a bit more free because you don't bind it to, to MATLAB license. Uh, but, but okay, in academia, it's usually not a concern. Um, uh, there are student MATLAB versions that OpenPV works on them perfectly fine. Um, okay, so Optimal concentration of tracer particles in viscoelastic transparent solution. Wow, I think the way is, uh, so again, concentration of particles, as you saw in the image, you should have eight to 10 pairs of particles that are moving together more or less and not leaving the window. It's not related to viscoelastic uh, rheology, I would say it's, it's almost the same. Probably the flow is much more complex. So you want to have more particles in a larger zoom uh, magnification because there are very intricate things in viscoelastic fluids. But again, I think it's better we move to the forum. You ask that question there, you put your images, we will be happy to answer. We usually answer very quickly. Uh, and, and we are even uh, had uh, this, this kind of studies before, so we might have some ideas about how to improve uh, it. Two, two and, quick comments. Yeah. Uh, per, per this question, I think you need to over, oversee the flow dramatically. Um, okay. that, that will be my, 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 my first um, tentative answer. Just over, go to speckle domain because that's your, that's your best chance. And again, as, as Alex said, put, it, put the question in the forum. There is one concern, thing, sorry, Rui, but there is one concern that too many particles, as you have shown yourself, uh, might interact with surfactants or whatever viscoelastic properties you have and start interacting with the fluid. So you should be careful about that. Uh, so there is a trade-off between the physics and the, what you need for PIV. Uh, okay, so... Last, last comment, we would appreciate if everybody that participated in this um, short webinar and we appreciate everybody attending, if you can give us some feedback, if you, if there is interest to hear um, more in more details about what we have presented here. Yeah. If there is interest to hear about POD and um, other toolboxes, and if there is interest to hear similar webinar with Python, based on your reply and correspondence, we will, we will move forward. Yeah, so again, uh, uh, Subhani asked us about uh, 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 rule of thumb of volumetric loading of the tracer particles. And I think there is no such a number for like volumetric and physical units. It depends on your magnification, resolution of your camera, uh, strength of your laser, and, uh, and, and, and how many particles you will have depends on the thickness of the laser sheet and so many parameters. Uh, diffraction of the particles, how bright they are. Is, is, so it's, it, it's not such a number, there's no such a number. You should have tracers physically following the flow, representing the flow, all the rest is up to your experimental system. Yeah, okay, follow-up survey, it's a good idea, but uh, I don't know, we will probably post the follow-up survey on LinkedIn as well and ask uh, questions and uh, uh, people will vote about uh, other webinars, right, guys? Will yeah, we? yeah, okay. so a great. Uh, can you use OpenPV for PTV? No, for PTV, you should use our PTV, free and open source software, which is called OpenPTV. What a miracle. <laughs> uh, it does 2D and it does even 3D and it does stereo calibration and it does multi-camera calibration. There is a lot of stuff we do there. It's a, it's a completely different project uh, uh, and you are very welcome to join that as well. Uh, okay, I think we should uh, seminar respect with Python. Thanks for the idea. Uh, thanks for participating. And I think we should say goodbye here and move to the forum for all the following questions. I want to thank all the team. We have here a slide, all the people we should 
thank for the slides we use or for the data or for the software. Uh, and of course, it's a large team of developers. Uh, we mentioned specifically Denis Lepchev who developed the spatial temporal turn box in its first uh, version uh, back in uh, 2003, I think, uh, uh, worked with Roy and myself and uh, uh, several people who helped uh, with the birds. This is a starling, right? This is a European starling. Okay, yes. so that was a really amazing experiment. And I want to thank everyone for participating and uh, goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all.